Hi, I'm Blue, and today we're going to be having a conversation with Hassan Daniel, the founder of Father Factory. Hassan, thank you so much for coming and speaking with me, with me today. It's such an honor. It's my pleasure. I'm so glad to be here. So first, can you just talk about what inspired you to create the Father Factory and what that organization is? Well, I would certainly call this a calling um, that I had tried to ignore for so many years, and that was due to shame. Uh, but over the years, shame turned into anger as I viewed generational devastation of child sexual violence brought about in my family and in the families of friends and countless others um, who I met down through the years. So this became something that I had to do, that I needed to do uh, for so many people, and including myself. Right. So if you can, can you briefly talk about your experience with sexual assault and also your journey with coping afterwards and dealing with that trauma? What was that like for you? Sure. So a lot of uh, what I'll talk about is um, how this formulated into the Father Factory. You know, so the Father Factory in general is uh, to end generational child sexual violence um, by biblical counseling, coaching, and educating dads that had the experience of childhood sexual violence with hopes of preparing into um, intentional parents through biblical-based therapy. And that speaks a lot to my own experience because my experience of child sexual violence uh, was at the hands of a spiritual leader whom my family and the community entrusted with the lives of many children. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, uh, it was my early adolescent years um, leading into my teenage years. Uh, and uh, th that experience shaped and reshaped my life. So what are the things that helped you manage and deal with your trauma after going through that? And what are the, some of the things that you also teach the dads at Father Factory? Well, Father Factory is a model after my personal um, evidence-based practice of how this works in a person's life. And uh, I, I sum it up in three functions. One, we are naming the issue. We're naming uh, what the assault was, what the act was, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of power in naming what right. you have experienced. And then secondly, we go on to start to identify the triggers that come up uh, from the impact of that trauma that you've experienced. And in identifying those triggers, we are simply uh, stopping and realizing how this has affected us, um, how it impacts how we see the world, how we are uh, engaging with our loved ones, engaging and raising our children. And then finally, the step is to walk in the truth of the Holy Scriptures. I found my, my peace in understanding and having a worldview, a Christian worldview and perspective to the experience that I've had. And we share this with dads in the hopes of seeing um, a, a, a road towards healing. Right. And so trauma can manifest itself in so many different ways and triggers. What are the most common triggers that you see in fathers and in other people around you who have experienced the same thing? That's a great question. Uh, some of the triggers, uh, and triggers vary for, for uh, everyone differently. Uh, I would speak personally for this particular one. So a trigger for me, I'd be overextending myself, right? Um, you, the overextending yourself when you are finding that someone is being gracious toward you or someone is being kind toward you, you, only, you almost, in a sense, try to earn and uh, be worthy of the good that is being shown you. As opposed to the Christian worldview, is that uh, my worth my worth is sold up in um, the fact that God created me and the fact that He put me here on this earth uh, to do some really wonderful things and the things that we're doing even today. That's great. So, what was your journey like from being silent to speaking out, and when and how did you decide that you were ready to share your story to other people? Well, as I mentioned earlier, when the anger of injustice 
um, came about when, when I started sensing that that strong injustice of how uh, it would impact entire families and future generations. Um, uh, while I was still a young man, my children were still a factor in my mind, right, of community of children um, that would possibly be vulnerable to this particular uh, crime. Uh, when I realized that it was not only that I wasn't the only one hurting and that there were others that were hurting, uh, I knew I needed to be a voice uh, that it wasn't, I wasn't brave to uh, be that voice. As I said in the beginning, it was about shame. Uh, the, going through molestation, uh, one of the things that uh, perpetrators depend on, uh, particularly in boys, is that they are, they feel a sense of shame, that they feel shame and that they feel guilt. They want them to believe that they were uh, participants in uh, the act that because they responded and their bodies responded in such a ways of being aroused or um, uh, feeling uh, any uh, uh, emotions behind that, that they are, uh, that, that this is what they wanted. And this is what um, uh, perpetrators do. Uh, uh, they groom um, children in this way. And so knowing that how malicious this was and knowing that there would be countless men um, that will take this to their early graves and have taken this secret to their early graves, uh, empowered me in a way that said, uh, silence is not the way. Silence is, uh, is me being irresponsible to this call of uh, seeking the justice of God in this earth. Mm -hmm. Guilt is such a common thing for women and men and anyone experience having having had experience sexual assault um, how do you overcome that guilt yeah. you know the, the idea of guilt denotes fault mm -hmm. and i think if we stop there and rationalize that thought uh in this situation you were and um and people have been victimized right an individual had been victimized they are survivors survivors may feel guilt because they believe that there was some fault in their victimization um it, that most times is due to this idea of uh because um it's a irrational saying so a irrational thought let's say that firstly um but there's this thought that says I should have been able to stop this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the scarier and the more demanding uh, thoughts that come out is, why did this happen to me? This should not have happened to me. And why we, why I particularly say that that's irrational is because it actually happened, right? And so if you're grappling with something that already happened to say that it should not have happened, it is going to be some unrest in you. And so it, battling and, and, and really getting a, a different understanding of what that means or a worldview that actually rationalizes that for you will really help. Um, you know, it moves people in the wrong way. It makes individuals punish themselves um, after they have been victimized. Uh, my Christian worldview is that all things work together for good. The good and the evil events in our lives uh, work for ultimate good. Um, it's unfortunate. We don't want to ever experience it. Um, it is, it is um, not uh, anything anyone wishes upon anyone, but there is this, there's this magnificent way of how it all works out for good. Um, had I not experienced that, would I be here right now talking to you exactly. and you um, opening up a platform as such to uh, save so many people's lives and make so many people aware of uh, these um, treacherous things that happen. Right. And I think it's that a huge part of the healing process is taking yourself out of out of that situation and realizing that you really had nothing to do with it and that you had no reason, you had no way of stopping it, that it's such a huge part of 
um, taking away that guilt off of yourself. For survivors, how do you change the narrative and not let yourself be defined by this one moment in your life? That's a great question uh, because that is exactly what's happening, right? So this event has happened and it and boom, mm -hmm. it has uh, shattered uh, this definition of who you believe you are and what it is that you are to do in life. There's a lot of confusion around this. It's a struggle, right? And it will always be a struggle if your eyes are set on the approval and permission of people to exist. If you need people's approval and permission for you to exist, then it's a place of no hope. Uh, the Apostle Paul in the Bible gives a great way of how to define yourself. And this is a way that I've not heard uh, anywhere other than the Christian uh, worldview. And that is this. Uh, he says, I don't care what people think of me. And people are probably like, oh, yeah, I, I, that's what I live by. That's what, you know, that's my thing. I just don't care what people think about me. But he, he went a step further and he went on to say, I don't care what I think about myself. And see, that's the place where many people stop and say, hold on. I don't care what people think about me, but I have to care about what I think about myself because I'm going to make me better, right? He goes a step further on to say that what he cares about is what God says about him. And the, the summing of that up is this idea that God creates me, he puts me in this earth purposefully, and he is the only one that has the potential to define who I am. Mm -hmm. And so in redefining ourselves, it is really this idea that we let go of what people think about us, and then we really start deconstructing our own view of ourselves, and we start now taking on this idea of the very purpose that we were placed here on this earth and the mission that we have in this life. That's great. Thank you so much. How can boys work through the stigma around sexual assault and really accept what has happened to them? And what's the process like for healing for boys versus girls? Is it the same or is it different? Boys, unfortunately, are working through this um, in probably different ways than girls are because vulnerability is not often um, acceptable for boys. Yeah. So being vulnerable uh, gets you labeled as a punk sissy, um, whatever uh, names society throws out to try to demean and to say opposite of what it portrays as masculinity. Uh, so boys have this very difficult uh, challenge in speaking out and to actually get the help. But how boys probably need to do this is one, um, not alone. Right. Uh, we can't process this within ourselves and try to work this out and make this happen and uh, change uh, change us. Right. Because we're we're biased to uh, what our society has set up and set out for us to be. So it definitely uh, needs to happen in a loving and caring community of people that understand this this main thing. And this is one of the things that I preach often, and that is that men hurt mm -hmm. and that it is OK for men to hurt. Right. Um, hurt happens for men just as well as it happens for women, happens for boys just as well as it happens for girls. And um, being able to acknowledge the humanity, being able to look at uh, uh, individuals hurt. We are living in times now where there's rioting in the streets because um, there was this, um, this denial of uh, another person's pain and another person's hurt. There was this loss of humanity for seeing and hearing someone cry out um, uh, they can't breathe, that, that they're in pain. Um, and 
that spills over to how we are working even with our children. That spills over to how we are viewing our society. Uh, we are really in so many ways saying, just deal with it. Mm-hmm. And um, boys are taking that up to just try to deal with it. And the sad reality of that is that it comes out in ways that they now um, can become victimized uh, womanizers and uh, victimize other individuals or live out their anger in a way that um, that tries to re um, I guess or try to you know um, reaccount for the things that they have experienced in their lives. It is definitely uh, for us to look at those biases that come up in us that don't allow people to talk about this issue. Right. And it's so interesting how you talk about hurt and how, you know, people really, they might not be speaking out about it, but their hurt manifests itself in different ways. They could be wanting, their, their, it could manifest itself into anger, and that's how they're trying to tell to communicate to people around them that they are hurting and they're, they are going through this. But it is really important to talk about it. So how do you find those resources around you? How do you establish a support system that you feel comfortable with adults around you to talk about it? Like, what are the ways that one can do that? Yeah, yeah. again, another great question. Uh, you know, th- this support system, I believe, starts with those people that um, have in mind for you a long-term uh, care, a continuum of care, right? Because this is not a one-off to deal with this issue. It is not a one conversation to have. If you have experienced sexual violence, you are um, uh, going to uh, process that at different stages of your life. Mm-hmm. And that um, at these different stages uh, of your life, there's this unfolding of who you are and this um, uh, probably redefining of who you are um, and gathering of uh, what this means. Uh, it is different from when you are a child to when you then have children of how you are processing what you experience. Um, there are a, a number of great um, organizations out there that are doing some amazing work. Uh, firstly, the Father Factory. Uh, exactly. Secondly, uh, I, one of the, uh, <laughs> the great, thing, the great uh, supports that I have had personally is an organization called um, Male Survivors. And you can also look up um, the Center for Control, um, Disease and Control, um, which has a lot of great information and st- statistics. But there's another organization that's also called oneinsix.org, which really does this great thing similar to uh, male survivors, uh, which is to uh, put the facts out around molestation um, versus the myths around molestation. And this is a really great thing because uh, it really gives clarity to what happens. And you can always, and I... uh, ask everyone to please visit us at thefatherfactory.com where we share a number of um, uh, facts and different things for people um, and resources for uh, going through these stages. Thank you so much. I mean, it's so important just to have the conversations to work through that pain yourself, but it's also important to have the conversation to normalize it because it really is something that happens more than you think. And I think it's easy to detach from that reality and think, oh, that's, you know, so far away from me. Like, that can never happen to me. But it really, it happens way more than you think it does. So having that conversation is really so important. Um, So another thing that a lot of survivors experience is that they feel like they can't trust anyone after going through this. How do you rebuild trust in other people and also trust in yourself that it won't happen again? Yeah, um, you know, um, Dr. King told us that when we are silent, you know, evil gets this opportunity to flourish, right? And um, when um, when we come to that realization, because I think, you know, after having experienced uh, sexual violence, um, you're probably not just ready to share. You may not just be ready. I, I make it a practice that even as I do interviews and talk with people, that I'm careful to share in safe um, environments for myself. 
Um, when I feel safe, um, then I share. I don't make it an obligation for me to share uh, my story or my experience. Um, and you would say, well, you lead the father factory, right? <laughs> like you have to talk about this. I, ideally at the father factory, um, we're not getting people to come in and tell us what happened to you and what age were you in. And um, what we're really um, going for is to look at the impact of what happened the trauma that, um, and the impact of that, how it is now um, through the work of ACEs, we understand that there's this connection between your physical health and your mental health uh, in contrast to what you have experienced, and that could be years ago. So at the end of the day, it really is the survivor's choice whether or not they want to speak out and report. So what would you say are some things to consider when someone is thinking about whether or not they want to report it? and how do you know you are making the right choice for yourself? So the things to consider is, one, are you ready, All right? Because what comes after reporting um, isn't always the way we want uh, the responses to be. Uh, when I began to talk about my story and I actually confronted the perpetrator uh, in the community, the church community, in reference to uh, the victimization that I experienced at his hands, um, I was shunned from the church. I was, I was told, well, uh, you were of an age where you could have did something. Why didn't you do anything? Or um, I was told um, he's the man of God and you should not you know, go against the man of God. God is going to get you for talking like this. Um, uh, when, in fact, people have lots of suspicions of um, him committing acts like this, there was this community that still uh, felt the shame so overwhelmingly that they responded in a very adverse way. And so I, I think uh, as... Um, the uh, survivors are looking to share, they should not have an expectation of what they're sharing will do. Um, in some cases, that sharing may lead to a great uh, revolution, right? Uh, in other cases, um, there have been reported uh, parents telling children, um, don't talk about it. And so like, it's a sad thing that, you know, something like that exists that um, there is this environment or this community that shields uh, people. So the expectation is something to watch for. The other part is, is that you might not, you may not need to be, or you may not be the person to start the revolution, to go out there and start a father's factory, but support a father's factory, right? support the Father's Factory, support organizations that are actually doing the work, right? Because you, you may not be on the front lines of it, of doing the work, um, but you can help uh, vicariously that way. So what can you do if you are in an unsafe environment to share your story and when you are scared of the repercussions? How can you find a safe resource? How can you find a place to share your voice and speak out about it? Yeah. Um, for years, I did work with moms and dads um, doing parenting work, and we would uh, have a number of different things come up. And I can remember very vividly a, a, uh, a parent calling us um, and saying uh, frantically, he just beat me up and he went out to the store. Can someone come and get me? And, you know, getting a call like that, um, we're not 111, right? We're 911. Um, we are, we probably are 111, but not 911. Um, but we immediately begin to think about, like, what's the safest way of this person being able to exit this home? Um, the long-term effects, the long-term goal has to be in place. Immediately, we knew if this person was to get out the house that they needed a place to stay. Uh, they needed uh, other resources that were going to sustain them, right? Sometimes we're making those short-term plans 
without thinking of this, these long-term uh, consequences. And I say that in the same sense of uh, speaking out when it's safe for you to do so. And in some environments, it was not safe. For, for many years for myself, it wasn't safe. After I spoke out, it wasn't safe. A death threat came to me um, after I spoke out in reference to this. And so, um, but the safety piece of it are those people that actually help out, right? So uh, if it's law enforcement, um, uh, if it's, um, you know, community organizations, organizers that are uh, intentional about saving children's lives uh, and adults even. Uh, these are places, these are safe havens. I loved um, the idea of uh, kind of research and resources before you actually need them. So these, this is the opportunity. Maybe it's not safe for you to speak out right now, but what you could do is start researching and researching um, places that are trusted uh, over the years to have helped people in situations like this. Uh, it, th these are very important steps to make because you want to make sure that the safety issue is uh, is there. We're already afraid, right? Victimization yeah. puts you at a place of fear and it, it's just compounded fear when you don't have a clear plan of, of exit, a clear plan of crying out. Mm -hmm. And it's important to just gather those tools. Maybe you don't need them now, but when you do have a moment when you, um, you know, have a panic attack or are really overwhelmed with all these feelings, having those tools in your toolbox that you can use and know that like there are places to go to, hotlines to call, resources out there, even though they might not be close to you, there are they, they there are there. Another thing that's really common among survivors is that they feel really disconnected and uncomfortable in their own bodies. How do you regain control over yourself again in your own body and feel confident and comfortable with yourself? I believe separating um, the experience uh, from what uh, society says about it, right? Uh, separating mm -hmm. experience. Uh, earlier I spoke about the idea of, um, uh, which is very normal, that a person that has experienced uh, molestation physically responds, uh, experiences arousal, um, experiences um, uh, having thoughts, uh, reoccurring thoughts in reference to uh, the victimization that they've experienced and, and, and in some lights finding a pleasure in it. Uh, that is absolutely normal to have because you've had this experience right this experience has happened and um but now what then begins to uh to happen for us is that we begin to now begin to separate um what's good from what's um, evil right um getting comfortable back with your own body is really going back to the intentional purpose for your body Right? What is the, your, the purpose in your body? The body is there to carry out your soul, to carry out your spirit, um, to do work on here on the earth, right? Um, never to have been um, to be victimized or to um, be used in any other ways that it has. Um, but when we get back to that, we reclaim it. Um, and it is a daily walk. I, I don't want to make it seem like, hey, I got all the answers and here, try this and then voila, you're back, right? Because there's different stages of this. There's um, different manifestations of this uh, that happens. Unfortunately, some people experience, um, you, know, uh, you know, addictions from their experiences, porn addictions and, um, or, uh, you know, being so angry, right, yeah. that they, don't want to experience anything. Uh, so there's diff there's different stages of that. Be patient with yourself. Yeah. Be um, be aware uh, of what your body is saying and what um, and what is reality. Um, I always measure myself up against what the Word of God says, what the Bible says. Uh, this gives me great perspective on how I am to live out and to work out um, in this life. 
think it's a really unrealistic expectation to expect to heal from it. And so I really love what you said about, you know, it's a constant journey. You're always going to be throughout your life trying to navigate how the best way to cope with it is for you. And it is different from person to person. And it's just a constant journey. And even though you're never going to be completely, you know, healed, I think that it's a step-by-step, day-by-day journey of just trying to cope with it. Do you think that there are any necessary paths to recovering after trauma? And if so, what are they? Yeah. Necessary paths of recovering after trauma um, are definitely about um, regaining um, a sense of safety. Uh, when uh, you have experienced, you know, uh, sexual s- violence, there is this thing of how do I feel safe um, in this world? How do I feel safe in my body? How do how does safety? What is safety now for me? Right, um, because it's this um, fight or flight response that actually happens in us and it's the scenario of um what ongoing trauma does which is this idea that the the thing that caused the fear seems like it's always there and it's always defining and and um pressing you to be afraid um uh, earlier i mentioned um when you are seeking people's approval, there are those of us that seek people approval in a way um, that you have no worth if the if a person doesn't give you approval, uh, and that could be a total stranger versus your uh, your husband or wife, right? Um, but when that is possible, what then happens is that what they say and what they approve of begin becomes the thing that you live by and so we begin to kind of dethrone those things of your heart to reestablish what who can sit at the seat of your heart in such a way that will love you and carry you through all these experiences that you will experience through your life what takeaway messages would you want survivors to hear and what would you have wanted to hear yourself you're not alone. Mm-hmm. It's, it's powerful. It, it uprooted me. You're not alone. You're not the only one. You're not the only black young man who has experienced this. I've spoken to many of uh, uh, men who have pulled me to the side and said, I just want to let you know I've experienced this. And um, Just knowing that, wow, you isolated yourself in one regard to think you were the only one in the room, but there was thousands and hundreds of people that have experienced this. So you need to know that you are not alone. And in that, feel strengthened to know that um, the statistic is one in six. So there's someone likely to understand and hear your story. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other five out of the six have been impacted by the one that experienced it. So we're all in, this this is the thing that we all are touched by, that we all are moved by. So you're not alone. Um, There is hope. There is hope on the other side of this. There is hope as you work through this. Um, Don't do it alone. Uh, Don't do this independent of you. Um, submit your heart over to God, reach out, pray, um, ask for wisdom, ask for direction, um, and know that um, you are loved uh, in so many different ways. And you don't have to be the hero either, right? You don't have to be the hero. There may be others that speak out, support them as they are speaking out. Thank you so much, Hassan, for joining us today and having this conversation. I learned so much. And I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you.